The reasonable crowd that has gathered here to watch the closing ceremony has been waving and applauding and saying arigato or thank you in Japanese. Uh, they have witnessed uh, an extraordinary couple of weeks of sporting competition, even if they haven't been able to sit in the stands. And I think that it has served as a welcome distraction for the coronavirus situation in Japan, but also the world. Hello, I'm Jeremy Fernandez, sitting in for Paul Barry. Welcome to Media Watch. And what a fantastic effort by our Olympians who've triumphed in the face of a pandemic and a heat wave to bring back a swag of medals and give us all something to cheer about. Like Aussie Peter Boll, whose fourth place in the men's 800 metres final was watched by more than three million Australians and whose heartwarming backstory the media just couldn't get enough of. He was born in the Sudan, fled the civil war grigs at the age of four, ended up in an Egyptian refugee camp for four years. He spent four years in a refugee camp in Egypt. Bol, who fled Sudan before spending four years in a refugee camp. And Bol's inspiring story was also lighting up commercial radio. His family lived in an Egyptian refugee camp for years before making their way to Australia. Who, until the age of eight, was basically in a refugee camp yes, for four years. Correct. You get the picture. So did ABC Radio. Peter was born in Sudan, uh, four years in a refugee camp as a child. And, yep, the newspapers were lapping it up as well. In the Daily Mail, the West Australian and the Nine newspapers, where the human rights lawyer Nyadol Nguyen paid homage to Peter Bowles' parents who managed to protect and raise him in a refugee camp. A terrific story, but get this... It wasn't true. As Bol himself wrote in the West on the eve of his big race... Despite what some people have said and written, we never lived in a refugee camp. My family emigrated from Sudan to Egypt when I was four, and it was our home for four years. Fancy that, a black man who didn't come to Australia via a refugee camp. So where did that story actually come from? We've traced it back to this profile in the SMH five years ago. It then made it to Wikipedia, and as we've now seen, the story became gospel. We're pleased to say Peter Boll's wiki page has now been updated, which is more than we can say for many of the offending media stories. Now to another race, and one the media is also cheering on, the race to get people vaccinated. So it's been about 48 hours since I've had my vaccine and all my symptoms have completely disappeared. So if you can get the vaccine, I would really recommend you go out and do it as soon as you can. That's news.com.au's Ali Foster talking about her first AZ shot in a video diary posted on the news site's Facebook page. And she's not the only one doing her bit to encourage people to take the jab. The FM bad boy Kyle Sanderlands has been widely praised from the PM down for his rap video, which took aim at the Vax laggers. Too many people think Vax is a scandal. Take two shots and COVID's handled. Get Vax, baby. What are you waiting for? It's there. Get Baby. And last week on his Brecky show, Kyle continued his campaign, offering listeners a chance to put their fears about the vax to a doctor on air. There's been some rumours that the vaccine can make like, men and women infertile. Do you think that there's any cause to that rumour? No, not at all. There's no nothing to worry about there. The other one that's been going around is it makes blokes um, uh, impotent. They can't get an erection, but I can no, assure you... That's not true because I've, um, I've had several erections since mine. Also doing his bit was Kyle's newsreader, Brooklyn Ross, who made a six-minute video on the importance of the much-maligned AstraZeneca vaccine for younger adults. I've had my first AstraZeneca jab now because it is unbelievably safe and it is our best option. Because really, the risk is still low. We're obsessing for some reason about this one in a million chance. But it's not just KISS FM flexing its media power to nudge people to get vaccinated. 2GB's Ray Hadley also hammered home the message as he got his second AZ shot. And I'd implore everyone, uh, given that AstraZeneca is in plentiful supply according to the Health Minister, uh, for those over the age of 18, they exercise that right and get the AstraZeneca vaccine as quickly as they can. Also campaigning hard are the News Corp tabloids, which have gone from headlines like these in June... Flirting with Disastra. Astra own risk. ..to coverage like this following the death of a 34-year-old Sydney cider last week. Woman in one in a million AZ clot death. And on Tuesday, all of News Corp's city tabloids spoke as one. This, this is, is a race. race. It's not enough to rank high on the leaderboard at the Olympics. 
We need to be a gold medal winner in the COVID-19 vaccination race too. With over 11 million Australians across three states in lockdown, everyone would agree with that. On Friday, the telly was hitting that message again as it reported from what it called COVID ground zero. Dose of reality. Not one person in this ICU ward is fully vaccinated against the virus. The paper then named and shamed 10 Facebook accounts for spreading dangerous COVID misinformation, including a top spot, One Nation Senator Malcolm Roberts. Oddly, the telly overlooked the MP Craig Kelly and its now sacked columnist Alan Jones, who, as we've shown in recent weeks, have been freely spreading COVID misinformation on News Corp's Sky News. Maybe they're still coming around to it. Over on Nine, there's also been a change of focus. Only three months ago today was highlighting anti-vax nonsense like this. Yasmina Adler, the owner, yeah, that's right, Alex, says the concerns about side effects from the vaccine and wants the store to be a safe space for women. From what I've been, I guess, seeing, reading and speaking to other women about is the viral effects this shot seems to have on our reproductive health. But by last week, the Today Show was giving much-needed airtime to community leaders who shared their personal stories about getting AstraZeneca. After noticing hesitancy in the multicultural community, she recorded her journey just to show people how easy it is. I had the vaccine. It was so easy, super quick. Yeah, um, encourage everyone to get vaccinated. All in all, it's been an incredible turnaround. And the good news is vaccine hesitancy has nosedived in Australia, according to the Melbourne Institute, from 33% in May to 21% in July. That's thanks, in part, we hope, to a more precise media message. Now to the courts, where the media can always find arresting stories and plenty of action. Get your cameras off, I got my niece and I don't need these cameras on me, dog. There have been chaotic scenes outside the Adelaide Youth Court. Oops, sorry, I tripped. Oh, oh sorry. If human interest and drama is what you're after, the courts are where to find it, and not just on TV. The tabloids, in print and online, have made court cases and the sometimes colourful characters involved into an art form. Remember this story in the Townsville Bulletin last year? Townsville's 10 Hottest Criminals of 2020. And what about this story from the Quarry Mail last month, digging into the privileged lives of some offenders? How 12 ex-private school students traded classrooms for courtrooms. Or this one, a fortnight ago, profiling crims who've crashed out of social media. Influencers go from Insta fame to legal pain. Shaming petty criminals who happen to be hot on Instagram or went to a private school is good business for the tabloids. But what's the actual value in publishing lists of people who haven't yet been convicted? As News Corp has recently taken to doing in listicles like this. Everybody appearing at Melbourne Magistrates Court Wednesday, August 4th. And it's not just in Melbourne. There are appearance lists for courts in Brisbane, Sydney, Hobart, Adelaide and Darwin along with a host of much smaller regional centres right around the country, with the Townsville Bulletin promoting the Ingham list like this. See who made the Ingham allegedly naughty list. It's kind of weird. So why are they doing it? Well, you may remember that age-old rule that crime pays if you're trying to sell papers or sign up subscribers. And it seems these lists are lucrative. Back in 2012, the former Herald Sun editor Simon Pristall told Media Watch... We've done a lot of research in this space and, uh, and clearly football, crime and, uh, and breaking news are the areas that uh, people come to the Herald Sun website for. And it seems they're still doing so. News Corp insiders say the court lists have led to new subscriptions. And one local court told us they've fielded calls from angry people who thought they needed to buy a subscription just to check their court date. But the lists are also cheap and easy. We're told a division of news, Data Local, scrapes the information from court records and spits out the articles onto each website. And with News Corp launching a host of new online-only mastheads, some with a single journalist, this hyper-local content gets readers clicking with next to no effort or cost. But ask yourself this, is it really OK to out people as would-be criminals when they've not been found guilty and may just be up on a traffic offence? The company claims its lists, which are otherwise publicly available, are part of its commitment to public interest journalism. 
But Media Watch understands that judges in at least one jurisdiction have raised concerns. And in March, Legal Aid New South Wales told the state's Law Reform Commission that the naming and shaming was deeply concerning. It undermines the presumption of innocence of those appearing in criminal courts and may stigmatise the individual concerned. It may have lifelong consequences for those who are charged with a criminal offence, including those whose matters are withdrawn, dismissed or dealt with without conviction. What sort of consequences might there be? Well, try going for a job when the top Google result on your name has you appearing in court. As Katie Atchison, CEO of the Queensland-based Youth Advocacy Centre, told us... Since many employers now do an online search in relation to potential employees, these lists can no doubt prove to be problematic. The community wants people to turn their lives around, but then we put barriers in the way which make this more difficult to achieve. Asherson was particularly concerned about those up on trivial charges and those from regional areas where the stigma is harder to shake. Interestingly, News Corp now runs this disclosure above each story. The list is a public record of people appearing before the relevant court and there is no suggestion whatsoever of any wrongdoing by anyone named in these lists. No suggestion whatsoever? And is it really public interest journalism as News Corp maintains? We spoke to a number of legal academics and senior journalists who firmly believe it isn't. In a statement, News Corp told us... The material contained in court lists is published by the courts themselves and are public documents. Their publication is entirely legitimate and reflects the media's role in helping ensure our justice system is open and transparent. No detail is provided on charges and we delete the list after 12 months. That's good to hear, but for some, the damage may have already been done. And finally, while we're talking courts and crime, yesterday's Sunday News Corp tabloids were busy flogging their gripping new podcast series about the Mafia in Australia. Mafia dons sit down to murder hero they hated. The hero was the anti-drugs campaigner Donald McKay, who disappeared in 1977. That splash in the Sunday Telegraph also ran in the Sunday Herald Sun, the Sunday Mail in South Australia, the Sunday Mail in Queensland and the Sunday Tasmanian with this prominent photo of The Godfather. Mafia Godfather Tony Sergi, who was named as a key suspect in the murder of Donald McKay. But see how that Tony is featured with a horse? That's because it's a photo of Tony Sergi, the horse trainer from Queanbeyan, who is very much alive and most certainly not connected to the Mafia. You'd think someone could have checked because he looks a lot different from Tony Sergi, the Mafia boss, as you can see from this story about his death in 2017. Not surprisingly, yesterday's self-promoting splash has turned into an apology in all five papers today. We would like to make it clear that Mr Sergi has absolutely no connection to organised crime. The Sunday Telegraph sincerely apologises to Mr Sergi for the hurt and embarrassment caused by this error. It may take more than an apology to get out of that balls up, but it's certainly a novel way to promote a new podcast. That's all from us tonight. There's more on our website, including News Corp's statement on court lists. And thanks to all of you who've sent kind messages about Paul, who was knocked off his bicycle on Friday, leaving him with a broken pelvis and hand. He'll be recovering at home for the next few weeks, and we wish him well. Don't forget Media Bites every Thursday on your social media platform. But for now, until next week... Goodbye.